Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first session of the day for Aspiring Conversations. Uh, this session is all about technology, its impact on the economy, business, and our lives. My name is Mark Verbeest. I'm one of the Board of Trustees of the Southern Lakes Arts Festival Trust, and I'm Wanaka resident, and in my spare time, I'm the chairman of Spark. Um, and so I have a very real interest in technology, as you can imagine. Um, I would like to acknowledge um, and special thanks to McKinsey and Company, who have been a tremendous sponsor of this event this weekend, uh, and have helped us put this session together, and also PwC and all our other sponsors. And before we start and before we introduce the, I introduce the panel, I, if I could ask if you could all check that your phones are on silent. <laughs> now we're fortunate uh, to have with us today a highly credentialed and very impressive panel. And I'm going to have to refer to my notes because their biographies shouldn't be ch short-changed, they're pretty impressive. So first, Dr. James Van Yeeker. James is a director of McKinsey & Co, where he is the leader of their, glo the, their global high-tech media and telecoms practice. He's based in Silicon Valley. He's also a member of the, and director of the McKinsey Global Institute, their business and research arm. James has led research on business strategy and topics related to the global economy, growth, productivity, innovation and competitiveness, and the impacts of technology on business and the economy. He's published numerous books, papers and reports, and was appointed by President Obama to sit on his Global Development Council and is their vice chairman. He sits on numerous other bodies as well, spent time on the university faculties at Oxford and MIT prior to joining McKinsey, is a Rhodes Scholar, has numerous degrees in engineering, mathematics and sciences, and was born and raised in um, Zimbabwe and now lives in San Francisco. And one of his key clients are a couple of guys called Larry and Eric, who run this <laughs> who run this little company called Google. <laughs> Next to, uh, to uh, James, uh, Dr. Jacques Bougain. Jacques, again, is one of the leaders of the uh, McKinsey Global Tech Media and Telecoms practice. A director of McKinsey, he is based in Brussels. He also sits on the McKinsey Global Institute Council with James and is a fellow of the Aspen Institute. He co-leads the Digital Economy Initiative a McKinsey uh, knowledge program recently launched and is a fellow of ECOR, an economic think tank uh, based in Brussels and has been widely touted as being one of the five uh, top economic um, commentators and advisors in Europe. Not to be outdone by these uh, fine gentlemen, we have our very own Dr. Mary Quinn. Mary is the inaugural chief executive of Callaghan Innovation, the New Zealand-based Advanced Technology Institute, named after one of our most eminent uh, contemporary uh, scientists, Sir Paul Callaghan. Before returning to New Zealand, Mary spent 20 years working overseas in uh, uh, senior roles for NASDAQ-listed companies, including Eastman Kodak and Xerox. Mary graduated from Canterbury University with an honours degree in science, has a doctorate in science and engineering from Northwestern University in Illinois, and an MBA uh, uh, with high distinction from Harvard. An impressive group, an amazing group. Okay. Um, just to tell you a little bit about the format for this session, I'll ask each of these speakers to speak for a few minutes. James will give us a Silicon Valley a perspective, Jacques, a perspective of old Europe, <laughs> and uh, Mary, uh, the, uh, a New Zealand uh, commentary, and in particular focusing on the challenges facing New Zealand to, to, uh, 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 to move to a more diversified economy. I'll then facilitate uh, a discussion between the panel members, and we're going to do our best to leave a little bit of time at the end to take some questions for the floor. So if I could ask James to lead off. 
Well, Mark, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here in what is clearly one of the most beautiful places in the world. I went for a run this morning. It's fantastic, running by the lake. So thank you for having us uh, be here. I think we're living in a very exciting time. Uh, maybe a good way to illustrate this with just some observations and facts. Uh, so for example, two thirds of the people on the planet now have a mobile phone. A third of them already have access to the internet. <coughs> Uh, we're going to add another, thir another billion people in the next two years to the internet. We're going to bring new diversity and richness to the internet. Going in another direction, the Google car, driverless car has now driven 700,000 miles, hasn't had a single accident, actually except for one, and the one that it did have was actually caused by a human in another car <laughs> that, it, that ran into it. Uh, it took us uh, 13 years and $3 billion to sequence the human genome. Now it takes a couple of hours and a couple thousand dollars. And even that's gonna come down. Very shortly, we're gonna have about a trillion devices that can be connected to the internet, the so-called internet of things, uh, creating a, another new wave of t connectivity and technology that is not to do with humans, but machines and sensors on most devices. Uh, just before I got on the plane to come here, I actually called uh, Brian Chesky, who's the founder and CEO of Airbnb, just to make sure I got the facts right. And he told me that uh, the night before, they had actually put to bed 420,000 people. Uh, and that's far greater than any hotel chain on the planet. It's pretty extraordinary. Then you think about the pace of all these changes that we're talking about. And again, some numbers are very useful. If you think about the rise in prosperity in the world, if you go back all the way to the Industrial Revolution, it took the United Kingdom 154 years to double GDP per capita. It's taken, it took the United States 54 years to do the same. It's taken China 12 years to double GDP per capita. And by the way, just to put this in context, when the UK did this over 154 years, it was working off a base population of 9 million people. China has done this work of a base population of a billion people. The scale is extraordinary. Then you think about the pace at which we're all adopting and starting to use these technologies. It took radio uh, 38 years to reach its first 50 million people. It took television 14 years. It took the internet four years to reach its first 50 million people. And it took Google Plus 88 days to get to 50 million people. So breathtaking pace. So if you step back and look at all these um, things that we can all observe, uh, the exciting thing is that there's actually more to come. We're just at the beginning of these. If you look at all the, and I'll, and I'll highlight sort of three important trends that are worth keeping in mind in this conversation. The first one is just the pace of technology itself. Uh, there are many more technologies still on the horizon. Everything from what's now possible with synthetic biology uh, to what's now happening with artificial intelligence and the kinds of things you can do with that all the way to what we can now see on the horizon to do with energy. So there's a whole raft of technologies that are going to bring even more change and disruption. The second important shift that's worth keeping in mind is what's happening to the structure of the global economy. And here I'll, I'll give a few examples. There's a big shift east uh, in, the world, in the world economy uh, in terms of the size of the economies, particularly of China and India and other uh, uh, emerging markets. Uh, in fact, even, even the structure of how companies participate. So if you had looked in 2000 at the global uh, Fortune 500 companies, the largest companies in the world, something like 95% of them were actually all in the advanced economies. Very shortly here, actually in a few years, half of them are going to be outside of the advanced economies. These are the largest companies in the world. Another important shift that we don't talk as much about is what's happening to urbanization. And I think to put this in context is, well, first of all, we now have half the world's population living in large urban areas. But more, more to the point, uh, in about 10 years, something like three quarters of the world's GDP is going to be driven by just 660 cities. These are very large city, cities, and that's an incredible concentration of the world's economy around a few cities. And by the way, something like 400 of them are actually in emerging countries the advanced economies. And then you think about what's also happening as part of this shift to just demography. Uh, we now have 60% of the world's population living in countries that are now 
have fallen, are no longer replacing their populations, have fallen below the replacement rates of their populations. So there's a potential slowing down as the world becomes older uh, in most parts of the world. The third important shift I'd emphasize is what's happening with just how interconnected the global economy has become. Whether you think about the flow of products, goods, services, information, and even people. It's a much, much more connected world, and much more of the world's economy has to do with how well you participate in that highly interconnected world. And that, both, that raises some very important and interesting questions for countries like New Zealand. I'm sure we'll get into that conversation. Let me just make some final remarks, and I'm sure we'll talk about this. I think as all these changes happen, there are some important tensions uh, that we're all going to have to confront and think about as individuals and citizens and leaders and governments and countries and companies. And I'll just highlight three of those. The first one is what, what we've been, many of us have tried to term as the great decoupling. And this refers to the fact that we're starting to see, in the last 20 years in particular, evidence that we can actually get GDP and, in, and, and uh, uh, economic growth to happen, but jobs don't quite keep up. So if you'd actually drawn a little curve of you know, GDP growth for most economies, and you tracked you know, how jobs track to that, the two are increasingly starting to get decoupled, which raises important question about how we think about employment. The second important tension to think about is the tension between wealth and inequality. So on the one hand, I just gave you some statistics earlier on about how much more prosperous the world has got. In fact, it is true. If you look globally, uh, you know, in the last uh, 10 years alone, we've added a billion people who can now consume at extraordinary rates in terms of consumer consumption. In the next 10 years, we're going to add another billion. They're going to add another 30 trillion of spending uh, to the global economy. That's incredible amount of lifting people out of poverty globally. Yet at the same time, if you look within countries, you're starting to see inequality tensions rise. Where I live in the United States, median wages haven't grown since 1990. They've been stagnant. And yet the top end has grown extraordinar extraordinarily. So you now have these tensions between wealth, global prosperity on the one hand, and inequality within countries. And then the last one I'll mention is around just how we think about the benefits of all of this uh, and how we balance that with the risks. As much as we love and I love technology, it raises a whole set of risks, whether it's around cybersecurity, privacy, and all those questions. And we're also worrying about the tension between economic growth and protection of the environment. So there are all these tensions between the benefits of all of this and some of the risks and challenges that it poses for us. Let me stop at that point. Thanks, James. Uh, let me start with two small comments. Um, first of all, coming from Europe, it's a long way. Boy, fantastic country. I love it. Um, second comment is I'm, I'm Belgian. I'm not French. Uh, that means that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we are in the dark. If you look at the French and they look at Belgium, we are in the dark, possibly like you are versus the, the, the Australian. The, the beauty of being an underdog is that we can do whatever we like. <laughs> <laughs> and the point of that, if you look in uh, Europe, I mean, Belgium is actually the center of gravity of Europe. It started in uh, 1957. <laughs> we did it. Uh, the French are still complaining, but we have Brussels at the center, at the center of uh, the universe. Uh, so this being said, let's talk to, uh, on digitization. Um, again, an anecdote to start with. Uh, when I joined McKinsey 22 years ago, uh, I was pretty proud of one innovation, and that innovation was the voicemail system. At that time, there was no PC. Well, we had a PC, but a big PC. Very difficult to, port, you know, to get it ported. Um, there was no mobile phone, and the internet was pretty much clumsy. It was still the, the classical dial-up. You had to dial a number. It was doing like a small noise, and then you got possibly a connection. Now, uh, obviously, when I got the, you know, to, to recruit people, and when I go to INSEAD, when I go to MIT and the like, obviously, these people know everything about me because they went on the web to check on my profile. They basically know everything I've done, everything I've not done. <laughs> and uh, so the, the world has totally changed in 22 years. So I've got two kids, um, and, uh, you know, two years ago, we were just changing the TV because we were planning for the big screen because of the World Cup. Um, and obviously, my, 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 my small uh, guy came to the screen and tried to flip the screen and said, <laughs> <the t> <laughs> <laughs> and, 
<laughs> Dad, the, 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 the TV's broken. No, 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 it's not the way to do it. Now, I guarantee now he can do whatever he likes with the TV he's, he's playing on that. It's, it's quite fascinating to see that, you know, uh, technology is here to stay. And most of the time, uh, it's quite challenging for us just to keep the pace. Now, um, James put uh, a bit of the, the, the figures uh, and possibly has taken a view of uh, US as a center of universe, like the French do. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to go and take the old uh, Europe, as we just discussed. The beauty of being old in, in one way is that we have experience. Um, <laughs> and uh, if I go back to, to, to that, uh, you know, I, I want to, 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 to give you five messages, and I will go to each of them uh, a bit deeper. Uh, the very first one, if you look at digitization, it's actually old technology, uh, but the internet as a digital technology is changing everything. That's the first comment I want to make. To Europe, uh, maybe it's not fully true, James will be argue with me on that, but Europe invented a lot of the web technologies, at least the digital technologies. There was DARPA before that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, but uh, they lost it. We really lost it. Uh, and I think this, uh, I really want to discuss that. How, if you get a hatch, how do you lose it? Uh, what do you learn from that? That's the second thing I want to talk about. Uh, the, the third thing which is important is that James mentioned a lot of the factor of tension. Europe is actually uh, in a very tense uh, stance these days. Uh, you have to imagine that if you go to the southern of Europe, Italy, Spain, and like, you got 20 to 22 percent unemployment. So we're not talking about six, seven percent that you have in this country. We're talking about three times that rate, up to the point that most of the the, the, the families of 20, 30 years old, if you are in Spain they actually go back to live with their parents. So very uh, challenging time of tension. Uh, the second thing is that Europe is not Europe. It's not, you know, it's a lot of different countries. And, and again, before there were a few tension, again, the French and the Belgian, or it was in Belgium, obviously, the, you know, the Dutch speaking and the French speaking. But now we see a lot of retraction where people try, try to get their own region to be the center of gravity. Uh, we see the tension between the South and North. We see a lot of tensions between, within the north, between the Scandinavia countries and, let's say, Finland. UK, obviously, a very different point of view uh, uh, as to what Europe should be doing and the like. So a lot of tension uh, driven by, uh, obviously, the state of what Europe is all about, but also driven by technology. So this tension needs to be uh, discussed. Uh, and the fourth point uh, uh, which I want uh, uh, to make, and possibly a, a, a fifth one, is that there have been a lot of failures. And the beauty of failures is that most of the time, if you analyze back, you can learn from that. Obviously, we have a few cases uh, of success as well. And I will give you a bit of what can you basically draw from that and possibly a few uh, insight as to if I were to apply that to your country, what will be a few tips. So if I go to each of them very quickly, number one, uh, digitization. Uh, digitization, as I said, has been there for quite a while. So if you think about uh, media, the first digitization has been, you have a TV, most of the time, if you have a satellite uh, TV, pay TV uh, uh, service, it comes with a dig digital signal. It has been there in the 1980s. Then if you go to communication, uh, the GSM uh, uh, protocol, at least in Europe, has been the first digitized uh, process. Uh, but the internet has come after that, and it's slightly different and amazingly different in the sense that the internet is obviously a public protocol linking uh, every node. And on top of that, it's not about one application like TV. It's not about one application like communication and voice. It's every type of application can be hosted. And you can get e-commerce, you can get crowdfunding, you can get whatever you like. And so the fundamental aspect of uh, internet is that it changes everything. And market can be digitized, product can be digitized. So it's, it, it's changing everything. Um, the, second, uh, the second question, uh, the second uh, uh, point I wanted to make is that Europe was quite early in these processes. Uh, in digital, uh, you know, Astra is a major company in Luxembourg where you got uh, most of the dish in the sky and they were the, pr the, 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 the first ones to digitize the, the, the TV signal. Uh, the GSM protocol has been obviously uh, uh, done 
as a coordination between the different countries in Europe, as a way to create a, a communication uh, protocol. And if you look at the internet, uh, Jim is right uh, with the ARPANET, but again, it was invented quite a long time ago, by the way, 1973. So it's more than uh, you know, close to 40 years now. Um, but, but the CERN was obviously inventing that. The Minitel in France was the first version of the internet. It was a closed system, it was invented in France. Um, uh, so the, the point is that Europe was pretty good in infrastructure in thinking about the protocols and the like, but lost it very quickly. And that's my, 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 my point, which is uh, when technologies are unleashed, um, it's very important to make sure that you got entrepreneurship and you got people that can learn and basically run with them. And the funny thing is that, yes, Europe invented it, but it was invented in labs. Uh, and the Minitel was organized from a central point of view. It was centralized from Paris. You know, maybe it's the best democracy on earth, as the French think they are. But everything is centralized in Paris. And it's actually owned and basically managed by the governments. And if the government has no view of what the future will be, centralization is actually much more dangerous than anything else. So Europe lost a lot of that simply because the entrepreneurship, uh, the culture of uh, entrepreneurship is actually pretty much lacking these days. And that's obviously quite, in, uh, quite a, a key thing to remind you, which is you can get everything, you can be a first mover. The question is not to be first mover, it's to make sure that you continue, you sustain and you develop. Third thing, a lot of tension as I just, uh, as I just discussed, and the internet is actually increasing the tension. The reason being that, uh, again, public policy changed dramatically the way you think about Europe. If you go to Scandinavia, you know, Scandinavia will have a very well thought through uh, a perspective as to what the internet should be doing for citizens. So there's gonna be e-government system, there will be uh, a broadband infrastructure, uh, there will be protocol to make sure that, uh, you know, digital entrepreneur will exist. They will start with uh, online education system. So they will try to address any market failure with a digital spin. Now, if you go to Portugal, nothing of that exists. And uh, there is obviously in Brussels, one, you know, European government looking at the digital agenda, but it's all about high level aspiration. In 2025, everybody should have a connection. But the whole point is that this is happening today, the technology is happening now, and everything is changing now. It's not about 2025. So Europe is actually a bit in a mess again because the political leadership uh, and the way to think about the now is not there. It's too much of a long perspective they take. Now, what about the failure and what about the, the, the success? Well, in terms of the failure, I just discussed about, uh, about that. Uh, I will give you the example of France. France actually has one of the highest uh, rate of newborn companies on the internet. Uh, again, you all know possibly YouTube, but the first video platform was coming from France called Dailymotion. And what France has done is that they developed a lot of these technologies and new companies. But the mistake they did is that the big companies look at them, start to buy them, absorb them, and kill them. So uh, uh, it's a big learning too, is that how do you make sure that uh, there is a lasting viability of these companies instead of an m and and absorptions and where the capabilities are just lost. Um, so this is one key failure behind the public policy. It has been that it's not only that entrepreneur is lacking, when there is entrepreneurship, you need to make sure that there is a way to nurture them. Uh, so you can learn from that obviously in this country because this country is a lot of, uh, of small medium enterprise uh, there is obviously a very big company, Fonterra, uh, uh, but the whole point is that how do you make sure these companies can try and, and, and thrive? Uh, on the success side, there have been a, a few interesting success. So again, if you look at Estonia, uh, we're discussing among ourselves yesterday, Estonia as a country, by the way, it's not part of the European Union, but it's part of uh, the, the Europe. Estonia was the first country to develop from the citizen uh, an e-government and everything is voted directly decentralized digitally. Um, no wonder there were a few companies coming from there, one of which today is disrupting the telecom uh, market, Mark, uh, which is Skype. And Skype is today 30 to 40% of all the calls that happens cross-border globally are coming from Skype. But it was invented in Estonia. 
So you see that if you, if you start from the grassroots and you allow the technology to really uh, create uh, opportunities, opportunities stand and come. Uh, the second success uh, that I can uh, uh, tell you is obviously Scandinavia. You know, uh, maybe some of you are using Spotify, uh, and, and Spotify is also a great model where not only the digital infrastructure and the model is well thought through, but again, they were able to, to get all um, uh, the content partnership with all the music industry to make it happen and recreate a value chain as an industry. Uh, so there is success there. So these are my five points. If I go back to the, the, my last point I wanted to make, which is what does that mean for you? And I'm quite sure, Mary, you're going to jump on that too. But I, I have three, three simple things uh, to, 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 to look at. One is that it's not about technology. It's about what do you make out of it and how do you sustain, how do you encourage business model for what's the future going to stand? And it's starting now. It's not about vision in 20 years, it's about today. Second point, this technology, especially the internet, is changing everything. It will lead to social tension. It will lead to different types of models about how you think about social security, about environment and everything else. Uh, for you as a country, it's very important that you, as citizen, you embrace this, this question of externalities on top of the internet. And the third thing, yes, you're a small country. Uh, you're possibly not going to be playing on the global scale. Uh, you will not necessarily discover the next Google. Uh, but the whole point is that SMBs can export. They can do a lot. You can use a lot of these technologies. And uh, uh, the mistake that I've seen in Europe is that those technologies were pretty much embraced on, at the corporate level of big companies, not too much at the level of the small companies. And I think what you have in this country, it's a lot of small, medium enterprise that can basically use this technology experiment and do it for the benefit of the goods of uh, your country. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, fantastic to be here in Wanaka and uh, to be able to bring a more focused New Zealand uh, perspective to the two uh, views that we've heard uh, uh, from James and Jacques. So delighted to be part of this panel. You know, I think uh, the opportunity and the challenge for us here in New Zealand is one of diversifying our economy. I think in the 18 months I've been back living in New Zealand, it's really been uh, amazing to me to appreciate how high-tech our primary industries are, uh, and particularly agriculture, and that, that uh, biotechnologies and robotics and information and communication technologies are all integral parts of being such a successful uh, country in terms of the primary sector. And I think there's a lot of truth to the view that, in many ways, uh, agriculture is New Zealand's Silicon Valley. So it's a really uh, important and strong base for New Zealand to have that economic um, uh, source of, uh, of revenue, of exports, uh, combined also with other primary industries, uh, fisheries and forestry, for example. But is it enough? And that's, that's the key question. Um, it's like any time in a, in a personal po uh, financial portfolio, you have one sector of your investments being much more successful than the other. There's some rebalancing that's needed because otherwise you're at quite high risk to a downturn in that one uh, area that you're very dependent on. And of course, the recent shift downward in dairy prices in New Zealand uh, perfectly illustrates why it's high risk to you know, have, so to speak, all our eggs in one basket. And, and that's what's really driving a, a business growth um, agenda or strategy to diversify New Zealand's uh, businesses into a range of industries, and in particular industries that are very um, technology intensive because those are the industries that have the greatest growth potential in terms of global markets. They're the industries that require highly skilled and highly educated workforce, and that therefore also generate more highly paid 
uh, jobs, and that's what contributes to sustaining and growing a high quality of life and building prosperity uh, for future generations of New Zealanders. So that's really just setting the context in which why these uh, technologies, not only digitization, but a number of other core technologies are so important to our future. The other thing I've been really excited to see coming back to New Zealand, and particularly in this role at Callaghan Innovation, is how many uh, creative and diverse companies we already have around New Zealand, and not just in the main centres, many of them located in smaller cities and, and even in rural areas. And so that's really been uh, encouraging, and it's a, it's a fantastic sort of seed crop, if you like, to build on uh, for the future. So in New Zealand, we have no shortage of innovation and creativity and inventiveness. Uh, I see it every week. I'm just uh, constantly surprised and excited by uh, the terrific small companies that are doing quite creative things. The challenge we have is how to grow more of those companies into big businesses. And every society has a certain uh, proportion uh, of and usually a much larger number of small and medium enterprises. But our challenge is how to get more really big multinational companies that have their origins and, and their base, if you like, can still be considered, in a sense, uh, to be New Zealand companies while operating and exploiting opportunities on a global basis. So we've got the advantage of the diversity of businesses, and, and some of the examples are, you know, we've got quite a strong sector of companies uh, inventing medical devices. We've got uh, a lot of companies in the area of uh, telematics. We've got companies that are building some of some really leading edge unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, and, and I don't think it's appreciated very much, even inside New Zealand, let alone outside, how uh, strong that diversity and capability is. But it's a huge asset, but one that we haven't yet uh, fully exploited, I would say, to the benefit of economic growth. So what we do know is that to grow these businesses and to support that innovation and those bright ideas that are popping up all over New Zealand is making investment in R&D, investment in product development, because a good idea isn't enough. And it takes skill about how do you take that idea and turn it into a product that can be manufactured, or if it's a service, delivered in a cost-effective way, competitively with other companies around the world that are developing similar products and solutions. And that's, uh, that's the skill set that we really need to work on. And I think our focus at Callaghan Innovation and that uh, the vast majority of our organization are people who are scientists, engineers, technicians, highly skilled technical people. But we'd really like to be building, uh, uh, be a, a center of competency, if you like, on behalf of New Zealand companies to help with that process of product development. So we are involved in those actions or, or programs that support a company from idea to having a product or service ready to sell. And then our partner organization, if you like, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, when the company's got something to sell, helps take it into markets all over the world. So that, I hope, just clarifies the distinct role between Callaghan Innovation and NZTE, because I'm asked about that quite often. So what are the things that um, can really help companies? Well, first, it's recognizing that it's not just about digitization, but that usually is, plays a role in almost any product now. But there's also tremendous advances in advanced materials. And New Zealand has some unique capabilities around, for example, manufacturing with titanium, and probably the leader in the world in 3D printing of titanium products. Uh, as an example, you know, we have some very good plastics companies, we have some very good uh, ceramics companies, and those materials are needed in a whole range of other products, whether it's a drone or whether it's a medical device. So that's an example of, of a core enabling technology that we really need to continue to invest in and support. Um, you know, biotechnologies is another example. Uh, sensing and robotics. And very often it's the agricultural sector or the primary industries 
that have generated some of these high-tech capabilities. Now, our capability with stainless steel is a classic example that's originated from the dairy industry. But I think, um, you know, robotics, a lot of the, the companies doing really well, if I think of a company like Compact Sorting, is uh, second uh, market share in the entire world, uh, second only to France, <laughs> since we've been picking on France. But uh, they're in hot pursuit of uh, taking over number one position. And, and building these just huge, uh, you know, the size of a, of a, um, of a basketball court, sort of, or, or bigger uh, machines that can use uh, sensing technologies, can use computer programming uh, and analysis to look at every single piece of fruit and decide is it of this grade that can be sent off to supermarkets or is it going to be turned into uh, something in the, that ends up in a box of cereal. And unbelievably automated and uh, the, the largest system in the world is actually in California uh, from this company. So New Zealand really does have, uh, we have the capability to build these companies and for them to export globally uh, and they're supported by a really strong education system. But that education system is again, you know, one of the things that has to keep evolving really, really quickly. And technology and digital technologies are such an exciting enabler to designing the education system of the future because we're really at a point that it's not necessarily the teacher in the classroom who has to be the fount of knowledge about the subject, and particularly in fields like uh, information communications technology that are evolving so quickly, virtually impossible for, I think, for a teacher, at whether at secondary or tertiary level, to stay abreast of what's going on in the R&D and product development labs of companies around the world. But what we can use is remote learning to be able to allow our young people, and all of us actually learning throughout our lives, to be able to tap the best expertise and the leading edge thinking in these fields uh, through um, being able to view those uh, instructors and professors uh, wherever they might be, whether it's at MIT in, as in um, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, whether it's NCAD, uh, whether it's in Silicon Valley. So a huge opportunity to build the education system of the future that taps global expertise. And that leads to, a, uh, to cohorts of future employees that are really going to be uh, driving forward the product development opportunities in the companies of the future. When I talk to businesses, as I do uh, weekly, if not daily, I always ask, what's the uh, one thing holding you back from growing bigger, faster? And invariably, they'll say one or both of two things. I can't find enough skilled employees, or I can't find the venture capital. Interestingly enough, there's a, you know, when you ask the supply side of, of providing uh, skilled employees, the, the <laughs> education system, and the supply side of providing venture capital, they'll say, well, that's ridiculous. We've got loads of graduates coming out, or we've got this huge amount of venture capital in the world looking for deals. So there's quite a bit of work to be done to get uh, companies uh, really skillful at uh, understanding how to invest in employees and, and build their capabilities, uh, take those fresh graduates and give them the work experience. And that's where things like, for example, the um, student internship grants that we administer can be really valuable ways of getting uh, uh, students exposed to R&D in the business environment, which is very different from the R&D expectations in a more fundamental research academic environment. But we've got all the building blocks in New Zealand. We've got a lot of incredibly inventive entrepreneurs. And so I think we've got a really exciting um, journey ahead of us to turn a certain number of those companies that are SMEs today and make them big global uh, multinational companies of the future. Thank you. So some, uh, some different and very interesting, some respects complementary and some respects maybe slightly conflicting um, views of the panel. Um, I'd like to explore 
uh, a few topics maybe, just as, as uh, thought provokers. One in particular, the changes that we've, we, you've briefly talked about, the advances in robotics, artificial intelligence, digitization, uh, technology in general, what does all that mean for employment? And not just in the, in the context of maybe the number of jobs, but, um, and you know, we've had an interesting discussion about this yesterday, are we thinking about employment uh, in the right way? Yeah, I, I would take that on in the following way, Mark. I, I think there, there are, when we think about the role of technology and, and, and employment, two things are worth noting, uh, and I'll come back to how, what, how we might think about those differently. One is it is the case that, in fact, technology is actually automating a lot of jobs. That, that, is, that is inarguable. I mean, if anybody has gone to a factory recently uh, and looked around to see how many people are actually on the assembly line, it doesn't look like the way it looked 20 years ago. So that is, that, is, that is a fact, and in fact, in the case of most advanced economies, uh, take manufacturing for example, much of the employment reduction that's occurred has mostly been driven by technology-enabled productivity, much more so than offshoring actually. Uh, certainly that's the case in the United States. So th that, that, that is going on, and what's interesting about that part of it is that it used to be the case that we, all, we always thought that technology would automate just the repetitive jobs. But now we're starting to see it at the high end as well. So artificial intelligence is starting to tackle tasks, whether it's in the legal profession, in medicine, diagnosis. In fact, there have been enough demonstrations that, in fact, you actually get more accurate diagnosis in most d disease mm. categories through artificial intelligence than through your doctor, actually. <laughs> so it's starting to, it's starting to yeah. affect even that part of it as well. Uh, so I think we, we, have to, we have to grapple with that. The, the, the good news about that, though, is that the things that uh, machines and artificial intelligence and machine learning and all these things are good at tend not to be the things that humans are actually good at. So it turns out that, in fact, a lot of manual tasks are actually very difficult for robots to do, actually, still. For a very, you know, so uh, whether it's uh, manipulating for, in a very complex, dexterous ways, that's actually quite difficult. But the issue is that much of that manual work, uh, we almost seem to have an endless supply of it. So, so on the one hand, while well, we have this automation trend, you also then have to look at the wage side of things. So on the wage side of things, uh, we know that because for the, a lot of this manual work, even though much of it doesn't get automated away, at least not any time soon, uh, there's almost an endless supply of it. So the wages will tend to get depressed. So what you, the, what you end up with then is potentially high wages up at the top end because we never have enough uh, uh, you know, technology doesn't quite do enough quickly enough and those require high skills. And a lot of jobs at the low end, but the wages tend to get quite depressed. So the question is then how do we deal with that? I actually think one way to change the question is to think about it less as a jobs question, but more as an income question. How do we make sure enough people have enough incomes to be able to sustain the economy? Because regardless of what, what you may think about uh, inequality in a ideological social sense, which are important ways to think about it, but don't get me wrong. Uh, as an economic question, unless you have enough people in an economy who can spend enough to drive demand, mm -hmm. it actually doesn't work. Rich people spending a lot of money, they're not going to buy enough stuff to actually make the economy work. It just doesn't work that way. You're better off with many more people spending money in an economy. So as an economic question, we have to address the question of income. So jobs are one way to solve the income question. There are other ways to think about solving the income question. So whether you think about, I gave the example of Airbnb or Uber or any of these things, uh, there, are, there are some other issues with them, but at least as a source of income, it's an interesting complementary way to think about income. So I'd say let's solve for income, of which jobs are a piece of, but look expansively at that question. <coughs> Jacques, okay. um, you, you had a thought-provoking um, idea of, a, of maybe a slightly different model that, uh, that related to uh, employment versus income uh, that we discussed briefly yesterday. Do you just want to maybe explain yeah. a little bit on that? Yeah, we're just uh, challenging a bit of... Uh... Jacques comes from Socialist Europe. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite good, though. <laughs> um, 
Now, I, I wanted you to make th th three small, uh, again, observations and much more uh, 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 as provoking what you say, James, but also uh, uh, as a food for thought. The, the very first one is that let's go back to the statistic of employment. Employment is not a number. It's about us. And um, uh, the whole point is that if you get out of uh, university or, or whatever you know, education you have and you don't have a first job, for every six months that you will not find a job, it will take more than 20 years to catch up on the, on the wage of your fellow who has got a job, 20 years. So it's a question of fairness in the first place. Uh, and uh, you know, maybe you call it socialist, but I think it's important that fairness is important. It's not a question of equality, it's a question of access and fairness, first observation. Uh, second observation is that every technology uh, has disrupted you know, institution, markets, and obviously employment as a consequence. So the real question is, how do we uh, recreate the right cylinders? Um, and there will be friction. So uh, one of the reasons why employment is so challenging these days is that big companies are being disrupted. And big companies, uh, because they don't, if they want to keep the same growth rate as small companies, uh, need to grow a big number. <laughs> And so most of the time, the only thing they do just to compensate is to reduce employment as a way to recreate a source of productivity because it's very tough to grow. Um, but that means if small medium enterprise benefit from the, uh, the, the, those technologies, you, you, you mentioned a lot of those in, 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 in this country, uh, you know, if, they, if they tend to be you know, 110 or 120 of the size of the big coast, uh, it's going to take time just for that employability to show up in the statistics. So you got this tension of a few years. Uh, and uh, the question is that the political cycle of five years uh, does not fit with that kind of long-term vision, if any, we have one, in terms of uh, how you, you, you move the mass. And, and third, I would say, um, and the discussion we had yesterday was so, um, in fact, those technologies are creating new sources of jobs or newer sources of inclusion of, uh, of employment. So I, uh, here are a few examples. When, when, when uh, PNG in uh, early 2000 uh, made the point that as a, first, you know, as a fast mover consumer good, if you have to do 20 flavors of yogurt, uh, you, know, you can find 20, but the next five is just very difficult. And uh, what the CEO did at that time was to say, look, I'm gonna ask my former employees, my, f my, my customers, to come with flavors themselves, and we will co-create that. And, and the point is that they got a lot of people spending one hour thinking about what's the new products, what's the new flavor, and basically included their own time to produce, and they co-produce. Now, obviously, the former employees were happy just to find a bit of time to, 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 to do this, uh, they were not necessarily paid. So uh, obviously PNG got a lot of R&D for free in one way. But you know, if you go back now to PNG, ask whether people, they will pay people just for that, I don't know, 90 minutes a week of finding the right product, they will definitely say yes, and they will pay more. So it's a flexibility question and the like. The same thing if you look at eBay, uh, uh, or trade me for, for that matter in, the, in this country, uh, it was a lot of small medium enterprise trading things on the platform. And usually it was, you know, one man shop, you know, one man shop or people that basically have disability cannot be in the, in the market, in the labor market. We were basically trading on the platform. So you, you, you recreate inclusion in one way. And so uh, the, the, the real debate about employment is a fundamental one, uh, but also we need to make sure that, uh, if a, bus if a business is changing, or if, if a system is changing because of technology, you need to basically make sure you change the common of the system. And I think employment, the way it has been defined, which is a company will hire you, and this is the kind of salary that you're gonna get, and you're gonna grow by the ranks and all these things. This model is likely changing dramatically. And the proof is in the pudding. Look at Google, look at everybody else. Um, we see that the flexibility is much higher. Uh, you got kids, you, uh, and, and if you ask them um, what companies they want to work with and whether they, they think about working in the same company for the next 40 years, they will say, you're out of your mind. But 
when I started, you know, well, obviously McKinsey was not the same, but, uh, you know, I got a vision, I'm going to work there, I'm going to make a difference with this company. And so one of the uh, fundamental questions as well is that what's the social role of companies themselves in creating the education within the companies, the learning and everything else? The technology gives you opportunity to do it outside. And as well, this kind of tension needs to be worked out. So what about education? Um, what, we sh what, should, what should every country be focusing on um, in, in the context of skills? I know it's only one element, the involvement of companies. Um, you talked a bit about Mary um, is seriously important and um, people can't just sit by and wait for central uh, government to, to do stuff. But just in the context of the educational piece, what, what should we be focusing on? Are we, are we, have we got our resources in the right places? No, I think there's, uh, there's an opportunity to rethink education and work in a less serial way and, it's, and not thinking about primary, secondary, tertiary education followed by this uh, you know, work life that then goes on till retirement, but rather throughout our lives in parallel having varying mixes of um, play, learning, and work. And so that we are constantly uh, uh, adapting and expanding our skills because even uh, you know, a university degree today, in some fields, a lot of that's going to be obsolete or certainly inefficient, you know, four and five years uh, out. Uh, and the new learning has come very often from what the employee has learned from the corporation or the business that they're working in, or they're figuring out themselves if they're an entrepreneur who started their own business. So we also, I think, need a more flexible, broader way of capturing the credentials that are gained uh, through the course of work, rather than seeing educational credentials are just what's supplied by going to a polytechnic or a university and seeing that, that lifelong learning coming from many sources um, and somehow kept, and I think there's a huge opportunity probably for someone to start a company around that tracking. Yeah. Um, so I take that thought, uh, <laughs> tracking the idea of somebody's lifelong learning and being able to um, also sort of rank it in a way so that uh, if you've gained certain, if you've gained sales experience doing a 10 week program at Xerox might be different and high, more highly valued than uh, doing you know, two weeks of sales experience in, in a small company. Um, so I think there's just huge opportunity to think more broadly uh, and track and value uh, human knowledge and experience. Yeah, I actually agree with that completely, Mary. The, the, the thing that I would, a couple of things I would add to that. I think uh, we also need to be very clear what education is doing for us. I think at least it does two different things, maybe three. Right? One is there's education where we learn specific skills and specific, uh, often technical skills, you know, yes. learn to weld, learn to be code, be a software programmer, or whatever have you. There's that version of learning. There's a part of the learning where you're learning how to learn and learning how to problem solve. Uh, and I think the two are quite, quite different. And I think one of the things that's interesting is that I think increasingly there's often this mismatch somehow, and you pointed to it, between what companies and employers think they want and what our educational systems seem to be producing. It doesn't quite reconcile, so something isn't quite working there. Uh, there's also the question that I think quite often there's a, and I don't know how acute this is in the case of New Zealand, but it's certainly a big issue in the United States, which is often there's an information failure in the sense that often people don't realize that uh, certain industries have actually evolved quite a bit. So when people think about manufacturing, often they're thinking, oh, it's an assembly line job. Well, in fact, no, manufacturing these days, many of the jobs are actually not that at all. In fact, you're working with very sophisticated machinery, you're a software programmer, you're doing very different things, and often those play extraordinary incomes. And yet, so there's something often that doesn't work as well between the information signals, between what's required and what's possible, what's interesting, what's exciting. So we have to solve for that. And I agree with you, by the way, on your credentialing uh, idea, and I think somebody's going to build a business out of that, by the way. Yeah. So look, just very quickly, one, th one maybe final question before we, we just have some uh, 
brief time to, to take questions from the floor. New Zealand's place in the global economy. So <laughs> there are various things that, uh, in terms of the local economy, you could argue are under threat. Uh, you've got major players, for example, Amazon in the retail space. There are a number of um, online retailers that operate on a global basis. And we're all of us, probably a lot of people in this room, um, are accessing uh, uh, online retail. Uh, that's having an effect, uh, uh, sorry, an impact uh, in, a, in an effect on uh, local businesses here. Um, and it's hard for New Zealand to replicate that sort of scale. Um, uh, that's a challenge in a, of itself. So just very quickly, a perspective in terms of where you think would, would New Zealand would best play in terms of, of a differentiated space that we can do well in. Do you have a view? I have a view. <laughs> <laughs> um, coming from another medium-sized country. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> you know, Belgium. <laughs> um, no, the, it, I, I was just listening to you, and I, I didn't know about all these great, you know, companies that you have. For, first observation, it, it's not about producing and doing. It's about marketing. And uh, I'm just amazed by the fact that uh, I was working uh, uh, confidentially for the government in Belgium where we were branding the country back because we said, look, you know, and by the way, it's very difficult because if you brand an enterprise, either you do it right and you have growth or you have a sanction. Uh, the government, you know, pretty much does not care. But I said it's very important to have a brand. And what do you stand for? How do you make sure that these companies that are so good, so well placed, get the benefit? It's not only getting the product to the market is just to shape that market so people recognize it's coming from New Zealand. I mean, just amazing. You know, we got mussels, we got f French fries, bad marketing. <laughs> 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 but, you know, New Zealand, I know about the wine. And, you know, and, and, but I don't know too much about the great technology that you have. So first observation, digital will help you to market that quite significantly. And this is one of the learning we got from Oja uh, and McKinsey as well, James, when we look at the internet economy. Uh, Companies who basically leverage the simple web to exports basically grow twice faster than the one we do not. So obviously there is threat, but I, I think it's important to look at the opportunity. The, the, the second thing is that uh, you are possibly at the stage where you have a lot of uh, uh, cross-border connection, possibly uh, you know, you know, cable, submarine, connecting this back to Australia, to, uh, uh, to Asia and all that. What we discovered is that the fundamental uh, driver of uh, new growth is actually the data connectivity that you will have. And I give you an example, which is obviously bad for Belgium, but uh, Belgium used to have Antwerp, and Antwerp used to be the number one <coughs> up to the number two uh, biggest harbor. Uh, uh, and Belgium is 200% of, you know, 200 of Belgium is actually exports and and imports. This is quite open. Um, and uh, obviously we live on that basis for quite a while. But we didn't realize that obviously first thing that happened, Rotterdam, which is in, in Holland, started to build a competition on the physical goods. And in 2000, they just realized that they would never take over Belgium as number one. But so they started to develop all the global connectivity in Amsterdam. And now they, you know, 60% of any bits of information as data flow coming in the world is passing directly or indirectly through Amsterdam. Now you'd say, why should I care? Well, because they invested so much in that infrastructure, they build around that a lot of small, medium enterprise. They start to build, you know, service-based companies, biotech, and all these companies that need data, mm -hmm. very high throughput of data to make their business work. And that has created a cluster right. which represent 5% of the total economy of, of Holland, but 25% of their growth. So how do you learn from that? It's possibly an interesting discussion to have. Okay. Thank you. So um, I'll, I'll open it up um, to any questions from the floor. John, Mr. Beattie. Uh, thank you. Um, so Andrew Wizzy, who Mary May, Wrote a report late last year for the British.
British government, in which he said the role of tertiary institutions in the United Kingdom shouldn't just be research and education in terms of measuring outputs. It should also be economic growth. And I just want to ask the panel, and I'd be very interested in your observations, Mary, about whether we in New Zealand should embrace the thrust of that report and ask for measurement against economic growth out of our universities as well. I haven't read the report. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, there are so many elements that have to work together for good economic growth and clearly a really strong education system and one that is giving the next generation of, of employees for companies the skills they need is important. Um, I, I think if you see the economic growth happening and diversifying in the way that we want uh, and also see that the education system is meeting the needs of businesses for skilled employees and on a lifetime learning basis, not just the new graduate, you know, then I think we can assume that the education system is in fact contributing to that economic success. I don't know how tightly you can couple the two, but uh, I'd turn that over to people that are trained in economics rather than myself. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I would actually say yes and no in the following sense. Um, no in the sense of, if we think about the purpose of our education institutions, at least certainly at that age where we think about kind of secondary and tertiary, are much more than ec economics. They're much more about learning to discover the world, much more about learning to be curious about the world, much more to be learning about who we are and we find interesting. It's kind of the, the classic notion of a liberal arts education. If we think that's what education does, I don't know if I'd burden it with economic metrics in that way. It's about learning about life. But at the same time, I think it is important to think about particularly certain parts of our educational system that are more like training than they are education. So I'm thinking about more vocational skills. I think those are much, much more closely tied to, to, uh, to, to economic impacts and growth. But I would say, though, that the, as much as we may want to you know, fix and improve uh, our existing educational institution, I think the bigger gap that hasn't been fully solved is the lifelong, lifelong learning portion of it. Because what we find is that if you look at most economies, uh, for the most part, skills that people left their educational institutions with pretty much are it. There's very little that happens post that in terms of lifelong learning, adaptability, and learning new skills. Uh, obviously, it happens in pockets, but it hasn't happened certainly to keep up with the pace at which industries and activities are actually changing. I think that's the bigger problem to solve for. Uh, uh, so so, that, so, so if, if it were me, if I were king for a day, I'd actually solve for two parts. <laughs> I'd solve for the beginning. So the things that we do in very, very early learning and education uh, at the very early stages, ages five, certainly in the United States anyway, ages between five and about nine or 10, that's a crucial period. And then I'd skip ahead to solve for what happens with lifelong learning, and how do we make people more adaptable in their institutions capable of facilitating that? That's, those are the two ends I'd prioritize solving for. So JavaScript is a second language at primary school? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so, whether it's, so whether it's Java or Python yep. or C++, or, you know, the list goes on. <laughs> okay. Uh, so. I'll take one more question. My, my, the minders from the side are uh, telling me I have to wrap this up, but the gentleman um, Yes, you, sir, if we could get a micro microphone to you. Uh, one of the issues I, I feel might be that the difference between the US education and entrepreneurial classes okay. is very different to what happens in Europe and what happens in New Zealand. In New Zealand, we've got universities that are funded pretty much out of the government purse, whereas you go to... MIT, Stanford, wherever it is, and they have these enormous endowments that have come from industry and allows the signals, as you talked about, to be exactly. reflected and dealt with a lot more effectively. And also, we don't have an entrepreneurial class that's being directed by the civil service, which is what we've got, and which is where you pointed to in Europe as being a real roadblock. 
it's a big ask how we get from where we are now to being, you know, large endowments and an entrepreneurial class and large pools of sophisticated venture capital, but what are the baby steps? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'd make one quick observation. I, I think the, the educational system in the United States is actually in much far worse shape than you described Imagine. it, actually. Because all the examples you just pointed to are the few, very few elite institutions, whether it's Stanford or Berkeley, or I mean, the, the, that's, that's like the tip of the iceberg. The vast majority of it doesn't work very well, actually. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it works worse than most places in the world, whether you look at attain, educational attainment scores and so forth. So, even though those institutions are not top-down directed or funded, they have far worse problems about success rates, attainment rates, and all the rest of it. So the US has a heck of a lot more work to do, by the way, on that front. You happen to have picked the ones that work phenomenally well, uh, and it's really the tip of the iceberg. And that actually gives me a sense of hope and optimism, actually, for a country like New Zealand, because at least I think it's a sizable, manageable problem. And I think your institutions, for the most part, at least as best as I can tell from the outside, based on the global data that I see, work very well, certainly compared to the, to the United States. Yeah. yeah, you might be surprised, actually, at the OECD rankings where New Zealand sits on mathematics versus the US, for example. We're way higher. Absolutely. Yeah. Easy. <laughs> Sorry, Mary. <laughs> um, I guess I have saw uh, baby steps um, happening, if you, I don't know if they'd appreciate it being called that, but in the last few weeks, uh, once I found myself uh, sitting on the plane of, with the, next to the vice chancellor of one of our significant universities who was on his way to the United States to uh, talk to the alumni of that New Zealand university about being more actively involved in supporting and donating to the university, because it's not just corporations, but the successful American universities, as, as I know, having been an alumni of two of them, uh, you get hit up on for <laughs> giving back as a result of uh, what your lifelong earnings have been as a result of that esteemed right. education. And they're very, very good at it. But And then uh, about a week later, I ran into another vice chancellor who was uh, about to head out on his um, journey to the US to meet with a lot New Zealanders living and working, or, and not just New Zealanders, there may have been students who came here uh, to study and, uh, and to go and uh, talk to them about the university's vision and its plans and, and the areas it was investing in and, and get their assistance. So I think there is an opportunity for the New Zealand education system to see its um, its graduates as a source of support in future years and, and invest and contribute to endowments. Can, can I make a, 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 one final remark? Uh, one of the problems is, is, is the way we define it as education, and we tend to centralize it or to box it. And I, I would just make three points. First of all is that in your, you know, whatever education we have, uh, it's better to, be, to have a common sense than to be a very well-educated person. Some of the well-educated person have no common sense, and common sense <laughs> usually will help you not to be disrupted by robots in the first place. Uh, the, second thing, the second thing, uh, uh, we all know that. It's not about the education, it's about the role modeling. And I'm quite sure that uh, at least if I have to quote the 10 most influential person in my life, I'm quite sure I will go back to when I was six, seven years old, and one of my you know, professors there, which for whatever reason, was my, a role model. And the definition of a role model or the mentor is somebody that you think about you know, getting to its level and obviously drop it after that because you need to continue. But the role modeling and the like is something that is usually missing. And you cannot put a KPI or matrix around that. It's about, you know, but we need to get these people pay for what they stand. There's huge externality in education. You need that role modeling. And, and the third thing is that the proof that education is not only about getting a degree, a lot of entrepreneurs drop out of school for obvious reason. It's not because they were not clever, it's simply because they realized they were not giving them what they wanted to have to be entrepreneur. And you see that today, one of the most, that, you know, two things happen on, 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 on YouTube, as I said. YouTube has disrupted the video. First, 
they distributed MTV because it's a music video. And the second thing they are disrupting or in, in actually creating a new market is all the do-it-yourself videos. How to becoming a plumber because you have to fix things and the guy will take three days to come to your house. <laughs> but that creates jobs and create new, again, common sense education. And I think it's important to look at education not again as a central planning process and, uh, you know, you got a great diploma, I've got a great diploma, or whatever else. It's again about these things that will create the, the, the glue, I think. Thank you very much. Listen, um, I'm sorry to those people that have questions, and I have absolutely no doubt we could go on for hours um, on this topic. It's a broad one. It's seriously important. But can I thank, on behalf of everyone, the, the panellists for being with us today. I think you've seen some really interesting insights, and the most important thing is to actually take some of that away, and in no doubt it'll be food for thought, and give it some serious thought in terms of what it means for all of us going forward. So if you could please join with me and thank the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> now, just very quickly, uh, housekeeping. Um, we have a room off to the side where there is um, a cafe, bookshop. Uh, please participate, um, take some time, uh, have a chat maybe about what you've just heard. This auditorium, even if you've got a ticket for the next session, has to be vacated. But if you have a ticket for the next session and you want to keep your seat, by all means, leave something on the seat. Uh, but as I say, we do have to <laughs> vacate. So, Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, James. Well done.